Welcome back, everyone. Uh, if everyone could just take their seats, and we'll be ready to go. Yep. Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. If we could have a bit of hush. Okay, welcome back, everybody. I hope you all enjoyed your lunch in, uh, in the humble canteen over there in the pavilion. Um, and you've come back with your, your hunger sated, but your appetite for some brand insight restored. Uh, a quick note to let anybody who is expecting to be listening to the real-time marketing masterclass just now, you are in the wrong room. Um, and it's too late to change your mind, so you're stuck with us for the next hour and a half or so. Um, we've got two sessions coming up here in the Thomas Lord suite. A little bit later on, we're going to be talking about converting uh, social media into real dollars and pounds. Um, but just now, we're going to be looking at 360-degree brand management. Um, the world is changing pretty quickly, and brands have got to change with it. I think you can look around the building here to see plenty of evidence of that. Um, and it's not just that that the brands have got to change, but the way that they address the world has got to change. Challenges are coming in from every angle, and you've got to look at problems in 360 degrees. So how do you do that? Well, joining me this afternoon are going to be three people who I hope can tell you a bit more about it than I can. Uh, Chris Lightfoot is the founder of Whitestone International, which since 2000 has focused on developing brands as holistic commercial entities and improving the sporting experience. Chris has worked with a number of leading businesses and bodies in sport, including the ECB, just around the corner here, uh, Manchester City, the IAAF, Adidas, and uh, FIFA. On top of that, he's worked with a number of brands outside the sports industry across a 30-year career. Toby Okonowa is the chief executive of Havas Sports and Entertainment UK, which she joined earlier this year, where she is responsible for a team of 30 um, and looks after accounts including Barclays, Coca-Cola, and the FA. Before that, she worked on both sides of the brand and agency line with seven years at MEC Access UK and a spell as head of marketing at BBC Sport. Excuse me. Um, and our third panellist is Jeremy Edwards, the founder and content director at Activitate. No, Activitive. We'll get there in the end. Um, which provides sponsorship activation intelligence to clients in everything from sport to music and the arts to education and corporate res social responsibility. Uh, he's also a former journalist and spent his time reporting on the media, finance, law, and politics. If you'd like to all just come up and join me, your panel, ladies and gentlemen. to you all. I hope you've uh, had a good afternoon. Um, right, just to get us started, um, it's the question that I wanted to ask pretty much as soon as I was asked to moderate this panel. Um, what do we mean when we talk about 360 degrees <coughs> management? I know. Upset WG Grace. Okay. I think to me, in the way that we talk about it, is we, we say that value comes from every touch point, um, good or bad. So 360 degrees used to work horizontally and vertically. So we talk about strategic thinking, we talk about branding and experience, we talk about marketing and we talk about sales. And at some point, if that, that works you know, horizontally, we've got to structure and ensure that every single touch point is achieving its goal. So 360 for us is that by the time you get to sale, you've got to look at how that is affecting the overall brand reputation which in theory is a big component of driving the sale. So mm -hmm. you get that complete loop in our view of the way we talk about it. So the bottom line needs to hit the top line, but the top line needs to affect the bottom line. Mm -hmm. And you need to understand all the different structures to that and what their purpose is to ensure that you're also applying the right resources in the right places. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people will confuse marketing with sales or confuse branding with brand or confuse strategy with, with execution. And I think if we get those layers in, in correct order, then that's what we mean by 360-degree management for brands. 
Tove, what's your what's your take? Um, so my take on it would be much more of a um, a holistic experience of a brand for the consumers and, and the other stakeholders that are, in, are are exposed to it. I think in days gone by, um, there were individual channels that were used to communicate almost at the the recipient. Um, and what we've now got into, um, and something from my perspective, which I think is entirely positive, is something that is much more um, organic and holistic in people's experiences of brands. So I think we've now realized um, that the touch points that people interact with don't operate in isolation, that everything comes together to form the view of a, and the perception of a brand that um, any stakeholder would take from it. Um, and that, for me, how you manage that, that communication process is probably my first thought about um, the mm. 160 degree brand now, management. Now, Jeremy, with um, Activated, <laughs> um, you're working in a slightly different space. If you could just explain that to us. You're kind of working between the, the brand and, and the agency space. That's right. So, I mean, a lot of the work that we do is on the kind of research and consultancy side. So, answering your, your first question, what it means to me is two things. It means what are the things uh, that we, how we advise our clients in terms of their 360 degree brand management, but also it means internally. Uh, how do we ensure that we take a complete, holistic approach to managing our relationships with our clients? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess there's two kind of big sides to the issue yeah. and topic. So I mean, at, at the core of this is, um, thank you. Um, at the core of this, I suppose, is it's, it's comes down to communication, both internally and in, in, in the, you know, your your targets, your goals, and, and what you're trying to communicate to, to people who you're trying to ultimately to reach. Yeah, absolutely. I, if, if you look at a brand, and I think the important thing is we, we talk about brands, and, and traditionally within sports, there's a, lo a lot of people associate the word with brand meaning sponsor, or they, they associate the word brand meaning a logo, as opposed to what we're talking about, I suppose, and perhaps everyone here as well, um, is on, on the stock market, a, a listed company, it's a, a good percentage of its value will be in goodwill. A good percentage of that is in intangible intangibles, it's stripper or patent trademark Smith and Young. And what that is, is that is an issue of confidence. Now, it was said earlier that a brand is, and this is something we use a lot, is a brand is a promise, a promise delivered. And so what we're talking about within the context of where we're going is understanding a brand from a perspective as being that sports brands, as in rights holders, need to start to work with their brands to start to match those of rights owners or potential rights owners or existing rights owners means that that is where the true match can really happen from a, a B2B point of view. And so the brand in itself has a huge role in, in working towards internal efficiencies because it effectively focuses activity internally into a single or very clearly defined narrative which then everyone can get creative around and deliver through so many platforms. To the consumer, to the fan, you know, a brand is it is that promise. What it, what value is it to me? You know, why buy Adidas versus Nike? Which one has the greater value to you from a personal point of view? Similarly, cars, similarly cosmetic, similarly, so many things we buy is not just based on function and price and availability. It's based on what it means to me on an emotional level. So you end up with this triangle whereby consumer gets something out of brand, which is the experience as a whole. And you can manage that by understanding what you believe you should be delivering. And a lot of this morning was talking about understanding consumers. Um, partners get it because that's what they're looking for, is brand association. They're not just looking for a distribution model. And we must face the fact that the top five sports and the top five in the top five sports, life will always be good. The vast majority of us you're com competing at a much lower level. And actually the brand becomes a very powerful asset through which you can go out to market instead of having to push money into everything else. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a key point of attraction for consumers and partners. Mm -hmm. um, no, I mean, uh, when it comes to, to sport, there, there's obviously, uh, you, you touched on that just now, there's, there's a lot more to it. There's kind of, um, it's not just the, the product that you're picking off a shelf. There's, there's a whole lifestyle around it. There's a whole experience around it. Is, 
has has sport learned lessons from from other sectors in in that respect so when you look to things like music in particular or, or, or entertainment where there's you know there's the the live aspect there's the aspect where you're a follower there's the aspect where um, where it bleeds into other areas of, of your lifestyle uh, absolutely but I think sport there's a lot of sophisticated people within sport with great business minds but I think the industry as a whole is only beginning to wake up to what general commerce has been working with for the last 30 years um, in terms of we need to learn from the brands and bring in that experience and capability to ensure that we work off the same metrics but the great thing that sport has is the one thing that brands are desperate for which is that deep emotional connection which fundamentally is what a brand you know is around mm -hmm. where you have um, sporting events, properties, etc., that have got almost um, an embarrassment of riches in terms of engagement points with consumers in particular, with a really sophisticated understanding of how to build brands, how to maintain brands, that some of the sponsors bring to um, the, the partnerships that, that we all put together. I think when you get those two things working really well to together and symbiotically, then you can create things that are really powerful, both in terms of um, how it's communicated outwardly to consumers, but actually behind the scenes and how the two organizations work together and how they learn from one another to make the whole experience better for everybody involved. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, think, I think also because of that passion that sport has, and, and music has the same, it is an advantage, but it also introduces a whole bunch, uh, a whole different set of complexities, uh, uh, because uh, there's so the, because the fans and the consumers are so engaged, everybody feels their own personal uh, relationship and they have their own perspective on what that brand stands for and what that brand means, and uh, therefore, unlike if you are the brand manager of Procter and Gamble, where you are leading. Uh, leading the way in a sense into what your brand stands for and how it develops is a much more uh, contextualized and delicate subject about how you deal with the brand of a sports team or a rock band, etc. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things is that anybody discussing their sports team in particular would be quite resistant to it being described as a brand or might be quite resistant to it being described as a brand. I mean, is that is, is the whole um, relationship between the corporate side of it and that emotional side of it, something that you have to be aware of as well? Um, from my perspective, yes, but I, I, I think it's one of those things where defining a brand, determining a brand, you know, whether I think you're right, whether you actually bring the fans' opinion into that informative process of building a brand rather than necessarily dictating how a brand should be in the marketplace. Um, it, it's kind of, it's a business activity. You know, every brand does it, but they don't go putting it in your face and telling you about it. It's a case of you need to align ideally and work with your partners and also, you know, everyone internally to push a really powerful narrative. And what we're talking about here is something which goes beyond the field of play. What happens on the field of play is altogether a different different matter, but actually, you know, performance off the field of play is just as important mm -hmm. in, in the business side of things. And I think, therefore, if that's an internal business drive, it's not something you go and shove in the fans' face. And I think we can probably cite a number of examples where these changes or otherwise people saying what and who we are are determined in a way that doesn't integrate fans. And you can see the backlash in, in so many cases mm -hmm. for that. And I talk about multi-stakeholder world, which you know, the sports business yeah. is. You know, the fans have an absolute vested interest and will go to their feet yeah. for that. I think it's, it's, it's that old marketing adi adage of you have a brand whether you like it or not. You, you just take that view as to whether you're going to manage it mm -hmm. or how you're going to manage it. So I think also in this day and age, we, we work within a very sophisticated market where the vast majority of fans and consumers and people who are involved in um, spectating sport, um, they are very brand savvy. They deal with brands, hundreds and hundreds of brands on a daily basis in every aspect of their lives. And they, they see things that are incongruent, so it, it makes it all the more in, um, important for those of us who are involved in these type of um, communications, I suppose, uh, to manage 
the brands and the communication most carefully within areas where we know people are passionate and care deeply about what these entities are and mm -hmm. the brands that go with them. It's, uh, it does, I think, as you said, make it much more important that you get it absolutely right because the, the downside of getting it wrong can be absolutely catastrophic, as we've seen mm -hmm. many, many times. And the current yeah. environment yeah. has made it much harder because there's so much fragmentation. It used to be the case that you can manage your brand and you had a set of ten things to do. You know, what did the packaging look like? What was the umbrella message? What were the TV ads like? What were the print ads like? <laughs> what was outdoor? What were events like? Now you're managing across literally hundreds of platforms and channels and you're getting so much more uh, feedback and power in the direction from the consumer, from the fans. So it's a much more complex and constantly moving and changing content. Mm -hmm. Okay, well let's, let's, I think that's a good point to move from kind of the ethereal to the practical. Um, and looking particularly to you guys who are, are working in, in the agency space. Um, what's, what, first of all, what does a third party agency offer to a brand in terms of managing that brand in, in the public eye? Um, from my perspective, it, it usually and should bring in uh, you know, a specialist expertise for start. Um, you know, we often say that within our clients, um, and within the people we work for, and frankly, generally, that you know, m most people have, in component terms, what they need to build a brand with. It's like it's all in the top drawer, but the top drawer is a hell of a mess. And it, and, and, and it just needs to be, a lot of it is just about reorganization. Sometimes, as, as, as you go upscale, it can involve very s small things, can have very big consequences. So it's the agency's role to understand you know, the law of consequences terms of working with a strategy, aligning that to a business plan. So I think they do, they should bring an external expertise in, in as much as anything, you know, wood for trees and being blinded by passion. I think this is a thing we see in sport an awful lot is, uh, and I guess we can, we can suffer from that as an agency as well about our own product, but is it's very easy to get blinded by the passion mm -hmm. of your own business in front of you and forget that there's a, a world out there that consumes you completely within their own judgment criteria, not yours. And however passionate you might be, that doesn't necessarily make sure make a, for a good series of activities to translate that into market connection and emotional connection into the market space. So I think, yes, they bring an expertise, and they bring a beautiful, different type of thinking, but they must bring some form of specialism, I think. Mm -hmm. Specialist capability that you wouldn't use every day, but it's useful to have. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's absolutely it. It has to be um, a specialist, um, a specialism which adds more value than you can do within your own organisation. I think you always, as an agency, have to be incredibly mindful that you are bringing inspiration, support, challenge, all of the, 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 the elements, I suppose, that an objective view, though an informed objective view, can bring to that relationship. Um, for my part, I believe passionately that you have to work in total partnership with your clients, that you have to form a relationship which is, is close, that you trust each other, that you share information, and that you start a journey together um, with a common goal, and everybody sort of throws everything into, into the pot to that end. Um, so it, 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 it needs to be close and trusting, but bringing the expertise from a number of different categories and sports, entertainment um, categories that, that is going to bring more than they have currently got within their mm -hmm. own organisation. How early and how deep, sorry to throw things, Jeremy, mm -hmm. how early and how deep do you think that, um, that partnership should go? Is it, is it a case of the brand developing a vision of what it is and then bringing in an agency to execute that or is it a question of the agency coming in to help fashion that idea first? I think it can be it can be completely different depending on which brands you're working with. I mean, some brands have been are very well developed, very sophisticated, have got brand visions, brand keys in place, which um, they work with both on a local market basis, but quite often globally. And those things are developed, uh, not necessarily by the team that you're working with, and those are given. Um, in other organizations, you start from with a complete blank sheet of paper and if they haven't got that expertise within the in, in the organization then you'll develop that together 
Um, so I think it, it, it sort of forces the courses, but I think when you brought when you bring it, the two parties together on a particular project, defining what the objectives for those for the project is and how you're going to get there is probably um, the the sort of baseline that you would want to start to work from. Having said that, sometimes you get brought in as an agency to look at activity that's already been done um, and to refine and to make that better. So you're starting from a different point there. Um, and sometimes as an agency, we'd be brought in um, right at the beginning to set strategic objectives, work through strategy, um, and, and you're starting right at the beginning before you even work out which areas of, of either sport, entertainment, or any other areas of communication that you might get involved in. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that the main thing is being very open with each other and trusting each other um, with the information that you're all going to need in order to, to make the best possible outcomes. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, do you, do you have a different perspective? I've, to I've on this well, I've got, uh, talking about the first part of the, of the concentration of the competition, and I, I agree with almost, almost everything that was said, uh, and I think that also includes that sometimes agencies have to put their hands up and say, there's nothing I can do for this client, actually, it's not my specialization, or you don't need an agency to do this. Uh, but, I mean, the, re the real truth, the way I see it, is there is no one right way, and there is also no one permanent right way, even when you have temporarily found the right way for forming a relationship. I mean, we can all see, if you take the, the, the sports brand, example, you know, Nike and WK, their growth is so intertwined. I mean, WK is basically embedded into Nike as an agency almost part of Nike since, since the day founding in 10, perhaps even 10 years, over 10 years. And they have this incredibly tight growth strategy. And then you have an a, 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 a brand like Under Armour, who basically chops and changes its agency all the time when they have this uh, belief in being different and rebellious and always changing. And they use a really wide range of agencies because they have this belief in we always want to try something different, we want to be eclectic, we want to be really bring other people with I think. And then you have uh, a sports brand like Hummel, I think uh, Hummel's in the audience today, uh, who don't use any agencies. They have no agencies at all. So mm -hmm. they take a totally different, it depends where you are in the marketplace, what you're trying to achieve. So I think we have to recognize that there's no right way and there's no permanent right way. Mm -hmm. And then Toby, going back to your time at, at BBC Sport, um, yeah. What are your expectations on the client side from what an agency is going to come in and, and do, and, and what does your attitude need to be um, as the client? Do you, you know, how how open-minded you need to be, and how how willing do you need to be to stick up for what you perceive to be your strengths and and your way of doing things? So um, interesting. I th I think I saw my job as a client to enable my age to the to enable the agencies that I'd brought on board to do their best work um, and that actually took a lot more work than I initially thought it was like if you are, you get great agencies on board you send them on the, on the way and and they'll they'll just produce for you and it doesn't work like that you have to invest quite a lot into it so um, what I was looking for for from them was an ability to bring really amazing creative thinking not not just creative with a big C, but just different innovative ways of approaching the problems that we were all tackling together. Um, and to think about it within the context of uh, the brand that we were working within. So quite obviously with the BBC, then there are, um, there's a, a brand that sits around BBC Sport that would be incongruent to behave like Paddy Power was behaving, for the sake of example. Um, so it was bring me different things, bring me amazing thinking, um, but with a sense of what is going to be doable for a brand. What can we actually make work for us and what is going to be the, uh, the most effective and um, I suppose eye-catching communication that we can, we can possibly put out there. That mm -hmm. was my, my the time that we did it, and sometimes they'd come to us with, there was one particular campaign which I absolutely loved, which when we took it back to the rest of the BBC sport management team, um, there was a lot of reticence, which at the time I was quite disappointed about, because I'd, I'd sort of got, I'd, I'd got really taken up in, in that particular campaign, 
but actually, in retrospect, I think we were absolutely right that we didn't run it. So, you know, it, it is that push, being pushed by your agency as well as um, their, their specialism, I think, was a big thing for me. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a, a, an elephant in the room, and at this point, I'm going to remind you all that the hashtag for this conference is SP. PBC 2014, because we're going to move on to the way in which the brand conversation has changed. And it is a conversation now, really, rather than uh, a message that you're directing to people. Is that fair to say? Absolutely. But uh, in a sense, I think it always has been. It's just, it's just changed its form, because you can sit and theorize about a brand, and you can determine a strategy, and you can put it all in place as much as you like. But it's really, you know, it's a, another way of describing a brand is what people say about you after you've left the room. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the key point, is what people say about you that becomes your brand. And to your point, mm -hmm. you, know, you have a brand whether you like it or not. You, know, you have a reputation is another word for brand, which is only if people you know, don't understand the word brand. And you know, in that sense, the key challenge that it, it shifted from is initially it was more of a push. And now you know, that, that is changing in its dynamics. It's flexibility and it's rate, it's speed at which you know, things can change overnight now. It used to take a long time. Nowadays, that your brand can be tarnished very, very quickly or it can be built up very, very quickly. Either way, I, you know, I still want to come back to the core point. Is that doesn't belie the fact you shouldn't have a strategy and just leave it to the world to decide what you are because I think that's a very dangerous way of doing business. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the speed and the rate of that conversation. But a lot of brand is about emotive connections. And if there's a sector that has emotional connections, it's sports. And that comes through understanding the different value chains, the different value benefits that brands as well as partners get out of those things. Um, and turning that into real-time conversation, um, as much as it is you know, the lag conversation through marketing and through branding in particular, because I think another overlooked um, conversation is branding. You know, a lot of people see it as wallpaper. You know, let's, put my brand, just, let's put a backing up. You know, it's not. That, that is part of what people inherently judge as being good or bad, right or wrong, um, and for you or not for you. And these are all things that are important to consider all the way down the line. I think actually looking at from from a, a, a pure brand perspective at social media, it was a real move for very many consumer brands to almost let go of how their brand was being evolved via that co that communication. So via sh shared media, owned media, um, it meant that consumers had got a voice that then started to have an impact on how the brand was used. So it came from both sides. I think actually the sports world had been dealing with that for a long time. I think the, the fans of, of sporting events and of clubs have for a long time have almost been the custodian of the brand and would feed that back up into the mm -hmm. administration, if you like. 
um, in a way that hadn't happened actually within the consumer world. And it came as a hell of a shock to a lot of brands who felt that they had control over what people thought about them. They had control over the message. And when that started to become much more of a flexible, holistic, um, evolving, fast moving um, way of, of their brand being, being owned really by other people, I think that was where the shift really started. And we're really in, in that world now where I think most brands are more comfortable, are, are very comfortable with being in that space. And actually a lot of how their brand is perceived is how they respond in that space and how they deal with the conversation as much as a one dimensional message. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, do, are there different expectations um, and different challenges in, in that respect for brands that, are, that were purely sporting bodies before and, and for, for sponsors and, and other organizations that are getting involved in sport through partnerships? Yeah. I mean, I really want to come back to what was said. You know, I, I think this, to that point, and also to carry that through. I think, how how do you respond to this notion of ownership by you know your shareholders or your stakeholders, which large components of which are your fans? And obviously, I'm coming here from a rights holder point of view. It's very different from a rights owner point of view. Um, they they do meet and overlap significantly. But if you're a rights holder, then building your brand and your brand is a as I say, a promise, which in itself is a narrative or a conversation that you're, you're making out into the marketplace and then making sure that you deliver that. Control and flexibility, we all want to control our businesses. Um, but I think, you know, to your point, having that bravery to put it out there. But also, you know, it, it's not always about, as we saw earlier with added activism, it's not always about knee-jerk reaction to a situation either. You know, it, you, you can't just bounce back off every bad bit of publicity or if a conversation goes slightly wrong, but you know, it does. It, it is that sort of first engage brain, then engage now mm -hmm. type thinking that you need to apply to apply to today's media instead of first engage brain, you know, now to then think about mm -hmm. it afterwards. It's, yeah, and I think it's really, really important that if you There's do more pressure on that in the real time with it than if you had everything said before. Yeah, I mean, you know, as agencies, we tend to talk too much. Um, I think we'd be a lot better sometimes maybe just to sort of think before we speak. But I think there is that, that, that notion that really getting the conversation out there and thinking about how that might be responded to. And, you know, we could cite numerous examples that probably wouldn't be better politics here, but where people have just said something, that's been thrown back at them, they've been constant, and the whole thing has snowballed. And this is, this is I think, one of the things that we're so aware of is how quickly things can snowball mm -hmm. as opposed to just sort of disappear. So yeah. If it's on brand, it keeps to the narrative, to your point, being creative around that core narrative, which allows that flexibility and adaptability. Creativity ultimately becomes the answer. And creative language, creative expression, creative experience, um, one way or another, but mm -hmm. it needs to be based on a core narrative. Otherwise, that conversation can take you places you didn't want to go. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I just want to touch on, and, and then we'll, we'll open it up to the floor. Um, is, is the subject of authenticity. Now, you work, Tove, now with, with Barclays. Yeah. Um, you've already had quite a lot of experience, and have us with, with Coca-Cola, who are, are two uh, brands that are involved heavily in sports sponsorship. How do you address, um, you know, how do you address an audience that is probably going to have a, a little bit of a, a low tolerance for kind of a, a, a cloying or an inauthentic message? Um, I think both of those brands are, because they're, they're such long-time sponsors, have um, a sense of what would add value to the sponsor relationship and where pushing their own agenda too far is going to be counterproductive for either. So uh, it's certainly not in the, in the short time that I've, I've been with Havison, certainly in the, uh, the relationships that I've worked in before, had many sponsors that have come in and really tried to do things that are inappropriate or inauthentic in the sport that they're, they're partnering with because it sort of defeats the object of going in there in the first instance. Certainly, I think the, our, our philosophy is very much about partners going into sport and adding value to both the sport um, and the administration or to the fans' experience of that sport. 
um, and working w with the, the sport and within the sport in a way that does feel authentic, that does feel like it's the right thing to be doing for that particular brand. Um, I mean, certainly the work that we're doing with Barclays at the moment is very much about um, their philosophy um, as an organisation um, about doing the right thing and the spirit of the, certainly in the football space that we're working in um, around a concept of the spirit of the game, um, which is born absolutely out of the values that Barclays have in place as a business. Um, so it feels uh, we may try to make it feel as, as real as possible um, to the fans that are getting involved in it. Um, I think if you start to take on that feeling of a sponsor coming in and, and thinking that they may be the white knight, that they're somehow going to be the saviour of the game, that they're going to bring the fans all sorts of things that they haven't had before that, you know, that they may or may not want. Um, I think when the, the focus moves from the passion, the point of passion that the fans are involved in in the first instance onto the sponsor and the focus moves that a little bit too far, it's that that you start to get problems with. I think when sponsors are take that step back and look um, at how they can add genuine value to the the partner that they're they're working with is when you get better work and the fans for the most part will accept what you're doing and, and welcome you I mean I think I think we've had um, sponsors who have behaved in such a great way in this country for such a long time it's not everybody but there are there are really good examples of that um, that that consumers are, are really up for it you know that we don't get too much automatic pushback on a sponsor it's only if it's something goes wrong um, I think most people involved in in watching sport and being involved in sport realize the benefit that sponsors bring and as long as they bring the right attitude and the right um, collaboration um, then they're welcome for the most part I mean when you're managing that sponsor relationship you also have to be conscious of uh, you know how that sponsor is perceived outside that that partnership that it has with the sporting body—it's almost the, the reverse, where you know the real world can come in and yeah. and affect the sporting um, conversation rather than the sport radiating out to the real world. Um, yes, I think you know for the most part, sponsors get involved in is particularly the the really big sponsors. They get involved for um, a benefit to their business um, at the end of the day. Um, and yes, it has to, when you when you step outside of sport and into um, consumer groups who aren't particularly interested, it has to play um, in an authentic way with them as well as the people who are actually involved in the sport. Absolutely, mm -hmm. um, particularly I think in contentious in sports that can be more contentious. I think with a lot of the Olympic sports with um, uh, sponsors that go into smaller sports, it, it, it's it's pretty positive um, from both sides of the fence there. I think with some of the bigger sports there can be, with some of the bigger sports, some of the bigger sponsors and some categories of sponsor, there can be um, more of a, uh, I suppose, a contention about how that is being perceived. There can be more questions around that and you have to be absolutely solid that you, you can answer those questions and that you are behaving in the right way for all, all of the stakeholder groups. I mean, I'd just like to add that I think transparency is really key to, to that kind of authentic debate. I mean, you know, we work with a client who came up front and said, we have no synergies with this uh, property at all, but we love it, so we want to sponsor it. And is, you know, is that wrong? And I think, you know what, that might not be what, what, what they teach you at business school or at marketing school, but if you are transparent about that being the fact, you know, they say, we love this. We want to buy this team a player. We don't want to pretend that our business values are shared or anything. We just love being involved with it. And I think if you're transparent, you know, that's fine. You know, we're working with a, a cycling team at the moment and they're, they're talking about authenticity. And I think in, as most people know, you know, in the world of cycling at the moment, the best way to be authentic and real, you know, to be transparent with people basically is to spin a sport that hasn't been transparent for 50 years. Mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely right. I think, you know, for, for fans, for a sponsor to come in and genuinely say that to them 
if they mean it, that I think they'll accept that more than any other sponsor. Mm. They they just want somebody who cares about their team or their their sport them. as much as they do. If you you as a sponsor come in and say yes, I I, I feel that, and it's all an emotional thing for us, then they'll definitely buy that. Definitely. Okay. Uh, let's just open up and see if, if anyone has any questions out in the audience. Uh, if you could just raise your hand if you have a question. Anyone? No, don't be shy. This could be our today. Oh, we've got one just at the front here. Thanks. Uh, oh, Simon Long. Uh, quick question for all of you on the panel, really. Uh, we've heard today a lot of good words about the positive aspects of sports, whether it's emotional engagement or passion or being live and instant. But we're also in an industry where social change is seeing an increasingly obese population and a younger generation that's disconnected from sport and operating in a virtual world of sport. And I just wonder what your view is in the agency position about how we can remain relevant in sport, but also change with, with the way that the, the, the nation and social habit is moving. To answer, ask a massive question, because yeah, it is, it's fundamental. You come at it, in my view, from so many different angles. But if there, if we also see sport as entertainment, <coughs> you, know, you get people engaged. Engagement is the first form, presumably, of getting them involved um, and active. I also think that it, it's really hard when you, at, at that level, if you want to tackle specifically, in, I mean, sport has that capability to transform so many things on so many levels, but to actually deal with some real social challenges, you can do, except I think it's challenged in itself by the fact that it's the grassroots game, which is where that interaction and engagement truly has to happen. And in our experience, that is a really poorly funded area of sport, massively underfunded. You know, partners and sponsors often are basically some of the biggest contributors you know, to that level of, of engagement. But it's not considered as a primary business driver. And so I think it, it lives in a lag world where you know the, the sharp end of the business is looking for bigger sponsors, bigger players, better performance, more audiences, eyeballs and ears and all that sort of stuff. And somehow we do this sort of grassroots stuff because it's important um, somehow. I'm not quite sure. And, and, and both of those who work in it, when you speak to people in grassroots, you know, utterly dedicated, utterly committed, hardworking people. But I think I don't know the answer, truly speaking. I mean, that's one that needs to be properly looked into. But I do think engaging through education is one of the, one of the most, an education of any form. To the, the value of sport, and that can be part of that narrative. You know, so many brands, sports brands, do do great, great job. It's very easy to be critical of those that, where it doesn't happen, but many try really, really hard. Not least through the people that try and do it. But I often wonder whether they really get the support from the sharp end that's needed to a actually turn engagement into activity. I mean, when we're talking about grassroots activity, you know, we've we've been talking this afternoon about. Uh, managing a brand in 360 degrees and, and looking at it holistically, eventually a sport's going to have to realise that they're going to lose things at the top end, they're going to lose the interest, they're going to lose the, the sponsorship money, the, the, the eyeballs, if people aren't playing at the lower end. And it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, a riddle that lots yeah, of people are trying to solve. Yeah, it's like you, you can take that. I mean, there are some great examples of that that's going on already. Like, if you look at Canadian sponsorship of the National Hockey League, I mean, the last set of stats I looked at, like, 80% of activation of the sponsorship of the NHL in Canada is based principally around a grassroots amateur or community-based initiative, not about the play, not around the players or the team or the glitz and the glamour. And you know, there are different explanations as to why is this, why this is the case in this sport in this country. Partly because it's part of the fabric of the nation. Partly because of uh, the fact that uh, the NHL goes on strike all the time. So. If you activate around players and teams and they're on strike, you're stuffed. So, but you know, there are great examples of that. And I think we're gonna see touching on what you were saying, and this is keeping in America, you know, the NFL has this challenge now. It's the juggernaut that dominates American sport. Like at the grassroots level, kids are stopped playing stopping playing, injuries, insurance, the whole Friday night lights high school tradition of grassroots playing of American football 
is dying because of things that are endangering nature. And this mm -hmm. uh, this book has a huge task on its hands about how to reconnect with that area or how to find relevancy again in that area. Mm -hmm. Which would be good news for David here early on because a lot of those kids would then face us early. So yeah. <laughs> I I think that there um, there are a lot of I, I would echo your thought in that there's a lot of good community initiatives. Um, that happen, but they do tend to be more under the radar. And because they're not joined up, then you don't necessarily see the whole um, and the, all of the good work that is going on in that space, both from sponsors and from governing bodies, etc. cetera. Um, my thought would be if you could get, um, and it would be a, a big commitment, um, the government working with some commercial sponsors on a much longer term um, program, but it looks, it, it, you're talking about behaviour change, about social change, about the, the change in how our communities interact, um, and I think it's fair to say that many companies would be um, reticent about committing to something that is that long term, so not to say that, you know, it's not possible, um, but it feels to me that if we're going to look for a, a real shift in the level of um, of participation um, outside of a formal education setting, that it's going to take something like that. I mean, there was, yeah, there's there's been attempts at it before, but I I think that for me that would be um, <coughs> probably the next way forward, over and above what's happening already, which I think isn't probably as bad as we think it is. Well, I yeah. I do think though, with this point about conversation and narratives coming up and the speed at which we can discuss some of those things can happen will provide a huge opportunity for many people to, to look at it and, and do more than just in at the top end and, and activate all the way through back to sort of the 360 argument, you know, 360 brand management is, is about connecting the bottom with the top um, as much as it is the, the top with the bottom and the more we can do that in a, a more s in a social way that so that show that that social activity has an economic benefit as well. Um, you know, a, a lot of a lot of major firms prefer to hire people who have some form of sporting background um, over those who don't. Um, as a, as a career issue, you know, if you've got sport in your CV, you're more likely to get a job. You know, if we can prove those facts to get those as much as you know, connect the economic benefits and the lifestyle benefits rather than, I suppose, you know, don't we sometimes just sit there and think it's, it's another whipping stick, you know, and I'm just not sure that reporting on it is really going to achieve <coughs> anything um, when we put it in such negative terms. So let's put it in some very placed, positive terms of engagement, and we might we might see an uplift. But I think closing closing that gap, you did, you did ask about the biggest question, I think, it is. <laughs> you asked me, you asked me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Simon. <laughs> If I, I saw it really exemplified in a perfect vignette last week when a fast food brand sponsored a South Korean professional player of Call of Duty for a million pound sponsorship award. And you just thought the growth of esports and indoor gaming and calling that sport and then being sponsored by a fast food brand. And I just thought, where is the end point of this? <laughs> okay, well, we're just about to reach the end point of this, but I think that, that brings us on to a, a neat final question, which is, has, uh, has sport changed the way we think about branding, or has branding changed the way we think about sport? I would say branding would change the way we think about sport. Okay. I think there might be a bit of both. I think, we've, I think the brand world has learned from team brands and the level of engagement and passion that they engender as something to aspire to, but certainly the world of sport has certainly learned from the world of branding too. I would agree with the captain, because when you think about the long-term culture of football teams, they've had logos, they've had badges, they've had scarves, they've had hats, they've had shirts, all the things that we consider, you know, companies can do with branding. They've had followers and they've had fans. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks very much to Chris, to Tove, and to Jeremy. Uh, Michael Long is about to join us here on stage and just take you through the second half of this afternoon's session. But your panel, thanks.